All right, good evening, everybody, and thanks, uh, thanks for coming out tonight to hear our social studies presentation. My name is Tom Husar. I'm the social studies and media department chairperson. I work at Churchill Junior High School and East Brunswick High School, so I work with students and teachers grades 8 to 12. And my name is Dan Moran, and I'm the social studies supervisor for the district. I work for grades K to 12. I work very closely with Tom, and I, uh, I oversee the um, social studies programs for the whole district. Yeah. We both also started here as teachers. Uh, yeah, both of us came of age uh, at East Brunswick. All we know is East Brunswick. Yeah. I started in 2000 in the history department, and um, about six, seven years ago, I transitioned into uh, my current position. Yeah, and I started in 93 in the English department, and now, now here we are. So yeah. thanks for coming out tonight. And what we want to do is give you an overview of the department and try to give you kind of like a sampling of the kind of things that the students do from grades K to 12 and the scope of the program. Yep, so one of the things that I talk to parents uh, every year at orientation nights. So when I do a presentation for eighth grade uh, and 10th grade parent orientation nights, I always say that history class, as we all experienced it probably when we were in school, is very, very different than what our students experience today. So for example, when I was in school, at the high school, history class was, you know, the teacher kind of standing up at the front and just talking at us for a span of about 45 minutes. And, you know, I would just sit there and feverishly write notes. And every five minutes or so, I'd shake up my hand, you know, because it started to cramp until I, you know, go again for another five minutes. And the teacher stood up there and had the overhead projector and would kind of hold this piece of paper over his notes and would slowly go line by line by line. And that's what we did daily, right? It was just committing things to short-term memory. It wasn't really building upon any type of, of skill base. It wasn't doing something that made me better in my science class at writing a lab. It didn't make me better at uh, solving some sort of formula or problem solving in a math class. It didn't make me stronger in reading and interpreting complex uh, texts that I was facing in a language arts class. It just improved my ability to commit things to short-term memory, regurgitate it on an assessment, and then it was just gone. So one of the things that uh, Dr. Moran and I really, really wanted to do when we got together in this department was to make it much more kind of skills-based, to focus on the things that were transferable, to focus on the things in class that were <coughs> going to make students stronger lab writers in a science class, to make them better consumers of the language arts, to be able to read like complex texts like some of you see on your tables tonight. These are the texts that our students are grappling with, the skills that they're going to use not just as they go into different classes uh, throughout the district, but also as they go on in their lives, because these are the things that they're going to be working on uh, as they grow uh, into, into adulthood. So we want to kind of walk you through the skills tonight that we're going to, right, that we, yeah. that we have our students practice in the department, right? What happened? Oh. Wow. Oh, oh. Okay. Okay. We're going to have to go back. We, we flipped through everything really, really quickly there. Made a little <laughs> stick there, right? Um, but one of the first things you're going to see is we, we're very big on asking questions. We think historians ask questions. So we want to show you, right, some of the kind of the old school questions that Tom just mentioned, and we want to show you kind of some improvements on them, all right? So we just want to show you like a generic set of history questions that sometimes people might expect get asked in a history class. So here's the first one, you're up. In what year was Rome sacked by the Visigoths? Right. Yeah, this isn't, you know, you yeah. kind of like think We're not put you on like, the spot. Hmm, yeah, you know what the answer was. Uh, yeah. But that would be kind of like an old school type of question that we would have uh, in some of our classrooms. Okay, name three European leaders present in Austria at the time of the Congress of Vienna <laughs> in 1814. Okay, so 19th century Europe. No takers? All right, yeah. okay. What are the most significant differences between the presidencies of Millard Fillmore and Zachary Taylor? All right. In fourth grade, we focus on the history of New Jersey. So here's a question. How many municipalities are there in New Jersey? Right? Another one is, what's the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution? Right? More people might get that one, we think. Right? Which region remained free of European <coughs> domination by defeating an Italian invasion force? So the With, old, the old map. Map With the accompanying yeah, map. Yeah, so we got to have that map question. Okay, so now, truth be told, these questions actually came from old... Uh, exams that we used to give at East Brunswick High School and some of the exams that we gave at Churchill Junior High School and at Hammershold as well. So this would be kind of like a, a question that when I was in high school, you know, I would face. Again, these kind of you either know it or you don't type of questions, right? All right. So what we do is we like to think that we ask better questions. Not just we, but as we're gonna, you're going to see tonight, we get our students to ask better questions. It's a big piece of, of what we do. And one of the resources that we use in classrooms throughout the district is this. It's called the questioning chart. So the questioning chart was something that came from, I believe it was an elementary school teacher yeah. who first introduced it to Dr. Moran a few years back. And it was presented at a professional day workshop 
and it just took off from there. If you walk into a lot of our uh, classrooms, again, K to 12 throughout the district, and you look on the walls, in many of the rooms you see this questioning chart. And what we love about the questioning chart is it enforces the idea of asking higher order, higher level type of questions. To, again, get away from the either you know it or you don't type of responses that we found we were getting from kids because those were the types of questions that we were asking them. It also gets our students to learn how to ask these more complex questions. So if you see here on the top left hand corner, the area in purple, who is, who did, what is, what did. A lot of our teachers refer to those as Siri questions or <laughs> Google questions. Okay, and what they do with their students is, they, they've done this, a great exercise. They say, okay, take out your phone. It's an interesting question, take out your phone. And if Siri can answer that question, right, that's what it is. It's a basic question, right? It's an either you know it or you don't type of question. But there are questions that Siri can't answer. And as you start to transition into the orange zone, they become a little bit more complex, right? When would, when did, when can. Right? How might. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you go into the green, and then they're really more challenging. I've been in classrooms where a teacher, or better yet, a student, will pose one of these questions in the green zone, and mm. then it becomes the next 20, 25 minutes of the class as students start to kind of build on their responses to those types of questions. And this is a really important skill to be able to teach our students to be able to ask these questions. So this is something that, again, is it kind of anchors a lot of what we do in social studies. And it's a great reminder for our teachers, uh, but also it's, it's a great skill for our students. And a lot of our uh, students, their binders and their notebooks, they have this questioning chart like in there. On the first day of school, a lot of our teachers give it out and they have the students kind of color it in and they explain exactly what the significance of it is and then they have it in their notebook and it's something that you know, has use to them throughout the school year. I was in a classroom last week and I saw the teacher, all the students had this taped to their desk. So every student had the question chart taped to their desk. It's, it's everywhere if you go through the district, right? And again, like Tom said, you know, the, the, the best thing is, is to get kids thinking about higher level questions and that fuels their research. That fuels class discussion as opposed to just reading a bunch of facts. So what we want to do now is we want to take you back through those original questions and kind of show you what we expect now from our teachers and from our students and the kind of conversations we have in our classes. So here's the first one, right? In what year was Rome sacked by the Visigoths? Anyone know? 410, that's right. But, so that's a basic question, right? You could know that, but this is a better question. What led to the fall of the Roman Empire? And are there any similarities between Rome and the United States? Right? That's a much higher level question. We think that's a question much more interesting that you get a lot more mileage out of that a historian, a real historian would ask. Okay, name the three European leaders present in Austria at the time of the Congress of Vienna in 1814. Anybody? <laughs> no. Okay, so you have Prince von Metternich from uh, Austria. You have an Talleyrand. Hey, by the way, yeah. here's my cheat sheet. Okay, okay, because I had to look it up myself. <laughs> all right. So you have uh, Tsar Alexander the First from Russia, uh, uh, Frederick Wilhelm the Third from Prussia, and Lord Castlereagh from Great Britain. Again, this was uh, this was a question that was once on one of our on one of our exams. So what might be a better question? What challenges do leaders face after a war? Right. This is something that applies really to any conflict in human history. It's a great great question that you could ask kids. Okay, what are the most significant differences between the presidencies of Millard Fillmore and Zachary Taylor? Anybody on this one? Okay, so Taylor <laughs> dies in office, Millard Fillmore takes his place, and Taylor was ardent that he was not gonna compromise. And so the Compromise of 1850 sat on his desk and he refused to sign it. And uh, when Millard Fillmore took office after Taylor's untimely death, he signed the Compromise of 1850. Okay, we all learned it in high school, uh, right. but you know, it's one of those things that we forget. So what might a better question be? To what degree does a president influence domestic policy? Right? This is a question if you teach American history that you can go in in any time during the history of the American presidency and ask that type of question. It applies certainly to a class if you're doing on modern uh, American politics, but certainly if you're going back all the way to the time of George Washington. Our next one, how many municipalities are there in New Jersey? Anyone want to shout out a number or take a guess for this one? How many municipalities are there in New Jersey? 565, <laughs> right? That's a lot, right? So, so you could know that, but the, but the, the follow-up is, so what? This is a better question. What role does local government play in the lives of citizens? That's a big focus we, we talk about in grades four and grade five, right? And at a higher level, you could actually have a student, a high school student, ask, why are there so many municipalities in New Jersey? And if a student asked that, I can guarantee one of our teachers would say, that's a great question, right? And then they would kind of pursue that and look it up, right? 
And the last one, what's the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution? Anyone know this one? Anyone know what that protects you against? Unreasonable search and seizure, right, okay? So that comes up some, a lot in our classes, the Constitution, but a better question is, you know, how and why does it limit the power of law enforcement, right? I was in a class last week where the conversations were all about why would the Bill of Rights limit the power of the government instead of extend the power of the government? Why are the Bill of Rights all about what the government can't do instead of what it can do? And when you ask students that, they kind of pause and they're like, yeah, why is that? And that's a, that's a great teaching moment that's much more valuable than just memorizing the, the Bill of Rights. Anyone could do that, but knowing why they're there and how the, how the Constitution is written in such a way to, to restrain power, that's a much more interesting topic, we think. Yep. And finally, our, uh, our token map question. <laughs> Which region renamed, uh, remained free of European domination by defeating an Italian invasion force? Anybody? We got a one in <laughs> seven shot. <laughs> Let me take a guess. Anybody know the country? No. Yep. One? Oh, clo it's very close. You're close. Mm. You're on the right half of, of <laughs> Africa. Uh, number five. Oh, uh, sorry. Six? No. Uh, no, 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 it's similar size, so that's a good guess. <laughs> uh, no, Ethiopia, Ethiopia is number five. But again, it was another one that Dan and I, as we were kind of putting this uh, together, like, all right, let's just double check on this one. Ethiopia is landlocked. Yeah, no, it's, yeah. it's, definitely, it's definitely number five. Okay, so what might a better question be? What are some of the long-term effects of European imperialism on African nations, right? What are some of those effects that are still felt today inside of Africa? Why does Sub-Saharan Africa struggle so mightily? Can we connect some of that back to imperialism that took place, you know, in the in the nineteenth uh, in the nineteenth century? Mm -hmm. okay. So the next thing that was the first skill is historians ask questions. Another skill, and this is something we're really, really devoted to, really passionate about, that we started talking about the day we met and started working together, is that historians read. Y you really can't say you love history uh, unless you love to read. You can love the History Channel and things like that, but real historians read all the time, and that's what we want students to do. Yes, they read textbooks, but you, they read so much more. We're going next slide. Sure. All of the books on, this, on your tables, these are just a sample of the kind of books that students read in all of our classes from the time they're in kindergarten all the way up until they're seniors and start taking elective classes and stuff like that. So we do have the giant textbooks, but we also have all kinds of other things that kids read. And kids read a lot in our district, right? And they read more and more every year. Yeah, and it's not just reading for the sake of reading. It's like, what are they doing with that? That's something that's, that's really, really important. When we first kind of started this initiative, it started with this one book, uh, The Cold War by John Lewis Gaddis. And when Dan and I at first met, you know, I, I really wanted to sell him on this book. Like, I thought it was really, really important that our kids were reading in class. And at that point, all students were exposed to in a class, in a social studies classroom, was just the textbook. And students tend not to love to read the textbook. But I knew that they would really fall in love with this book if we just gave it a shot. So at one of our first meetings, I had this whole big pitch ready for, uh, for Dan. I was you know, going to sell him on this book. And within three seconds, I sold him on the book. And I had like 50 other reasons why we needed to do the book. He said, no, let's just do it. You're right. This is, you know, Gaddis is a great writer, and we should be reading those books. And then this one book has grown into, if you look around the tables, there's well over 35 books that are now in the hands of our kids uh, across you know, grades K to 12. And that's a great, great thing. In eighth grade alone, the average student is going to read four books this year. Four books, beyond the textbook, four books in class, one a quarter. That's a great, great thing because when they do that, they're not only getting a different perspective sometimes on history. They're not getting just exposed to uh, different types of writing. Some, some of it's historical fiction, some of it's true nonfiction that's really, really challenging. But it's also what we do with it that's really important. So here you can see on the screen, this is from uh, an eighth grade classroom where they're taking part in something called a fishbowl. And a fishbowl activity is where students kind of come together around a common theme in a book, and they have a conversation with each other. One of the cool things about this picture, this picture, even in this picture, right, you know, where's the teacher, right? Where's the, it's the kids that are doing it. The teachers are putting the students in the position where they could do these great things. And where the teacher is standing right next to me as I'm taking, <coughs> as I'm taking the picture, right? And this, the teacher is there helping to kind of push the dialogue when they need to jump in, but it's really the students that are doing it. It's the students that are reading it at home and coming in having these opinions about a book, the teacher giving them the, the prompting them with particular questions, and then the students having this free-flowing dialogue with each other. And we do it in a lot of different formats. So oftentimes we use spaces kind of just like what we're in today. You can see here a teacher in the media center. That's actually at Churchill Junior High School, but doing an activity that, again, is tied to reading, where students are having that conversation 
about what they read, and the picture there on the bottom right-hand corner I think is, is in a ninth grade classroom. Okay, so we're doing it in all types of ways. It's not just reading for the sake of reading. It's actually having a purpose, reading with a purpose, and using it in the classroom. And all those titles are tied into our curriculum as well. Right? Yeah. Um, another thing we do is that our, our adults in the district read a lot as well. We started something about four years ago called the Nonfiction Book Club, and these are the titles we've done so far. We've run it eight times, and uh, these are books that um, we get teachers from all across the departments and all across the district to come, and we meet three times a semester, and we read some books, and we talk about them, and sometimes those books trickle down into their class. Like this is a classic example was one of the first books we read was about somebody who escaped from North Korea from a prison camp, and uh, this book is now taught in our world history class. Um, but not all of them are, but it it's gives you a sense of the kind of culture we're building here, where the teachers are readers, and, and they don't read enough. And, and things that they've read, we've brought into our curriculum. And a teacher will bring in a book and say, you know, I read this, um, this graphic novel, and I think it's going to be really good, and, we, and we'll go that, and we'll pilot it that with the kids. So it's something that, that we're, we're, we have this whole reading culture in the department that we're really proud of, and that the teachers and the students have kind of embraced as well. Yeah, right. one of the cool things, too, about this is it's inspired a lot of our teachers to then use these books with their students right. in class. So beyond Escape from Camp 14, uh, Cemetery John, you see there on the top, that's about the Lindbergh kidnapping, uh, a great piece of New Jersey history, and you'll see in a slide a little bit later on in our presentation. The author of that, Robert Zorn, actually got to come in and meet with our students after they had read the book, which was fantastic. End of Days, about the Kennedy right. assassinations, another book that we use with our students uh, in class. Janesville, closing down of the uh, General Motors uh, facility in Wisconsin is another book that teachers are using in class. So it's great that this has kind of inspired a lot of our teachers to then be able to use some of these uh, in class. Okay, so our next skill, historians write, right? And that's one of the things, like what historians do. That's one of the things that we talk to our students about right from day one, right, right from you know, those early grade levels. What do historians do? That's what we're gonna focus on in our class, and one of those things that historians do is historians write. They write all the time, they research, and then they write about it. And that's a really, really, really important skill. It's something that, again, transcends social studies. No matter what area a child emerges from East Brunswick goes into, they're going to have to be able to write, okay? So it's really, really important, and it shouldn't just fall on you know, the language arts department. It's our responsibility uh, as well. So we do a lot of writing in social studies. One example, and you'll see a couple uh, out there on each of the tables, I believe. Uh, if you don't have one, I, I could certainly pass one to you. But we have our students work with these quite often. It's a document-based question. Okay? And we start these all the way to very uh, younger levels. My, my daughter is uh, a third grader at Memorial, and she's doing these document-based questions where they're looking at nonfiction text. They're looking at images and graphs and charts and things of that sort. Okay? And they're kind of breaking it down. Right? This is what a historian does. So if you look, this is actually an example from eighth grade, and there should be two on your table. One is about the American Revolution, and one is a document-based question uh, titled Leadership in the Nation's Early Years. But these are activities, again, that we're doing all the time with our students. And some of this text, if you go in and you really take a look at it, is pretty complex. It's challenging. But again, it's this skill set that we think is really, really important. Right? It's, it's one thing to be able to, to read history, to be able to analyze history, but it's another thing to be able to write about it. And that's a really, really important thing, and it's, again, it's something that we emphasize all the time. The assessment questions that we you know, ran through before, those are the ones that you would have seen in our social studies classes maybe 15, 20 years ago. But this is what a common assessment really looks like now. In fact, this is, I'm showing you, a common assessment uh, at the eighth grade level. This is what they look like now. And when, we started, sorry. Yeah, no, and when we started doing this, you know, sometimes the students would, would uh, complain to their teachers and say, what is this, English? Why are you making us write so much? This isn't English. And the teachers would say, well, you, got, you, know, you have to learn how to write. <coughs> and if you want to think about history, you, you know, it's much easier for the students to just memorize stuff. You know, they would, you know, that's, that's a slam dunk. It's a lot harder to form an opinion all right, about a number of documents or about a bunch of data you're handed and say, what do you make of this? And form an argument about this or do some research and really write all the time and not just one research paper during the course of the year. And your assessments become writing based as opposed to just um, true, false, or fill in the blank. That's much more demanding of the students, but we've seen how much, how much more it pays off. Yeah, and, and the other thing too is it's important to understand that the content's still really important. Like it's really important that the students emerge from their experience in East Brunswick schools, consumers of mm -hmm. the content. So for example, you know, a student is gonna read this book on Paul Revere, Paul <coughs> Revere and I, 
but also write about it as they're doing the document-based question on the American Revolution. That's how they're learning the content. So as opposed to you know, the teacher just kind of standing at the front and just you know, taking it from their head and, and, and putting it into the student's head for a very short period of time, they're becoming uh, owners of that content as they read through it, as they write about it. And what we found is it's, it's much more uh, a longer lasting experience uh, for the students to learn history in that way. So we're always writing. And going along with writing, two of the things that our district subscribes to, which we think are really, really terrific and powerful, are Turnitin and Newzella. Turnitin, if anyone knows what that is, it's a program. It, it's, it's sold as an anti-plagiarism detection service, where if a student writes a paper, it gets submitted to Turnitin. Turnitin compares that paper against its bank of papers that it grows every day and against things on the internet. It lets you know if somebody's plagiarized. But the real value of Turnitin, we found, is that teachers can give electronic feedback. So, so many of our teachers, and this starts in grade six, we have sixth graders doing this, students will submit papers or writing assignments and the teacher can make all their comments right online on the screen so there's no more handwritten stuff. They get back their um, comments much more quickly. Um, they can write much more. There's no illegible uh, <laughs> marks for when people's arms get tired. And students can respond to them. It's really, really powerful. And that's something that um, college students across the country use as well. So we have students here at Hammershold already using Turnitin. The second thing is that Newzella is a service where um, we always want students to do current events, right? It's not just about the Congress of Vienna. We want them to read what's going on now, right? But especially with younger students, they're all learning to read at different levels. Newzella is a service where it will take the same article about the same topic, right? And it will level it so that some students at one level can read the article, some students at a different reading level can read the same article, but maybe with different vocabulary, maybe more challenging sentence structure. And they can also have a conversation about it. Right? It's been wonderful. Um, teachers can, teachers can um, have students respond on Newzella. I've seen lessons where students have learned how to annotate online electronically using Newzella. So that's a really, really powerful thing. And again, what are the kids doing? They're reading and they're writing. Like that's what history should be. That's what historians do. And then the last thing is this year was the first year we were very excited about this was that um, in grades four and five, the ILA teacher is now also the social studies teacher. Right? So that's very, very seamless. And when we transitioned to that, it was not a big, it wasn't a, you know, a, a, you know, a big deal at all because we were doing so much of that in social studies already. So in ILA, when the kids do historical fiction, that will tie in with what they're doing in social studies sometimes. So it, it really makes everything much more natural and organic. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, and historians celebrate. Now what do we mean by celebrate? Not just class parties with cupcakes and things like that, right? But we mean that if you're a historian and you've learned things, you want to share it, right? Now if you're a professor, you want to try to publish and, you know, so you get tenure somewhere, right? But historians love to share what they've, they've learned, right? And we encourage that in all of our students, right? Um, we want students to think about their research, to get it together, and then to present it to people. And not to present it like a class report where somebody stands there like this, like I, I learned about Patrick Henry and Patrick Henry was. We want them to be able to talk to strangers in a public place, like we're doing now actually, right, and sell their research and, and get other people excited about it as well. So from the time they're in first and second grade, we want them to work on those speaking and listening skills. Right? Yeah, one of the things that I would always tell parents when I was uh, a teacher back in the classroom, uh, when we'd have back to school night, was I would say, part of my job is to prepare your child for the midterm and for the final exam. So for example, I could tell you right now, there's gonna be a question on the Atlantic Charter on the midterm exam where they're gonna need to know what provision number two of the Atlantic Charter is. I promise you that I'm gonna do that part of my job and I'm gonna prepare them for that common assessment even though in my bones I didn't like that common assessment. But those old school kind of questions, they were still around. But what's really important is that your child is able to emerge from my classroom as a more confident, public speaker, as somebody who can research, who knows how to research, as somebody who is a talented writer, because these are the things that they're going to need to do as they get on in life. And the thing that scared them the most was this, was the public speaking part, right? They knew, like any time it was, all right, who wants to volunteer to go first to come up in front of the room and speak? Nobody volunteered, right? It was always like I had to, you know, like I pulled the old pop school sticks, all right, Jimmy, you're first, here we go. And it was something that was a real challenge for them but it was so important. I mean, think about it, right? In life, everybody's gonna have to present an idea. You're gonna have to present yourself in an interview to try to win that job. Right? Everybody has to use that skill. It's so important, and it's something that we really need to be doing in our classrooms. And again, like Dr. Moran said, it's something we really focus on K to 12. 
one of the things that we're really, really proud of is at Hammershield, every student engages in presenting his or her research to the public. So we have different forums. One of the things we do is our famous folks festival, right? Another one is something called History Con. These are both started by teachers. We have wonderful, wonderful teachers in this district, right? And this is a place, kind of like an old school science fair, where students first research a person, and even how they get to that person, even how they decide to who to research, that's a whole process. But they research somebody, they learn a lot about that person, and then they present that person. We open up the um, cafeteria at Hammershold, there's different time schedules, and people come in and they interact with the students. And the great thing when you go, and, see, and these are just two of the, the many, many students who do it, the great thing is that when you go up to a student, they don't give a canned speech. So you don't go up to somebody and say, mm, you know, Jackie Robinson played for the Dodgers, and it's, you, they can interact. You could say, tell me about Jackie Robinson. Tell me why he was so important. And the student will do it. Um, you could ask those students really hard questions. We've done it. We'll, we'll ask kids really, really hard questions, and they're, they're right there because they become authorities on this, and they've invested a lot of time in it. So we have a thing called the Famous Folks Festival where the students research a, a, a person of their choice. And it could be somebody really famous, maybe somebody not that famous, but somebody worth the research. We do a thing called the History Con, where students might take a historical idea, right? Like say, like you know, um, uh, the Roman army, or, or um, you know, um, the original, the first Olympics, or things like that, right? And they research that. We have a lot of different forums like that. We have a thing called an in-class museum. We do things like this for the little kids. They have a thing called Night at the Museum. But we want the kids to learn how to speak, and we've learned that you don't teach kids how to become better public speakers by just saying, like, just go in the front of the room and start talking or go prepare an oral report with some index cards. So there's actual speaking and listening skills in the New Jersey standards that our teachers address, that they use in their plans, that they do lessons on. If you want people to become better writers, you have to do writing lessons. You can't just hope good writing happens. And it's the same thing with speaking and listening. So by the time the students are ready to do this, uh, they're authorities. And one of the great things about this is the first time we did this, um, the first time the Famous Folks Festival ran, I think it was three years ago, the last question any student asked in sixth grade to their teacher was, like, by the way, like, what, how, how many points is this worth? Like, they, they, they really weren't concerned about how many, they were very excited that there are a lot of people coming. And we get a huge, huge turnout for this. And every year when it has to stop after the first hour and they have to go back to class, they're like, oh! Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we, it's, it's really, really affirming and it's really, really incredible what these kids are able to do. And one of the cool things about this too is they're researching about people and topics that they're really interested in. That's one of the things that we have found when students are doing that, when they feel more invested in it, it becomes a much better product. They dig deeper into that research. I remember talking to this young man about Jackie Robinson. I remember asking him, because I love baseball and I love Jackie Robinson. So I, I gotta ask you, so why Jackie Robinson? Why'd you pick him as, as, as your topic? He said to me, he said, you know what? Because I love to play baseball. I had always heard about this guy, Jackie Robinson, but I had no idea who he was. I didn't know why he was important. I just knew he was important. He was like a name in a textbook to this kid, right? And I did all this research and here's what I found. He was so excited to tell me about who Jackie Robinson was and why he was so significant. And that was great. That was great because back in the old days, right, oftentimes you were given your research right. subject. You know, all right, you know, tell me about, you know, President Jimmy Carter and his domestic policies or something along those lines. Where in this case, these students got to experience and research something that was interesting to them. And that was the skill that we really wanted the students to focus on. Right. That's another example. Recently this year, we, uh, a teacher did a thing of a class museum about inventions. So this young man over here did the electric guitar. He plays the guitar. And I spoke to him, and he was really, really eloquent about, about, about the creation of the, of the electric guitar, Les Paul, and things like that. Because again, he was really interested in it. Um, he could have picked whatever he wanted to within reason, right? But the point is that the subject that the students pick is almost beside the point. The point is using those skills. So that was great to see the points. And eventually, we want them to be able to do this when they're older, right? And that's an example of one of our high school kids talking at the Innovations Expo yeah. about what he was doing in his history class, right? Being very, very eloquent. You notice, like, you know, he has a little thing in his hands, but he's looking right at the people. W these kids get a lot of confidence as they get older, and it all starts when they're little. Yeah, it's amazing to watch. When you're yeah. at one of I don't know if anybody had a chance to go, to go to this last year, but the confidence that with which these kids speak is incredible. It really is. I think back when I watch these kids, and I think back to when I was in high school and how nervous I ever was you know, to actually speak in front of, of an audience of 20 kids. Forget about you know, being somewhere like this where you have people from the community who you don't even know who are kind of coming up to you, and you have to talk to them about what you're doing in your class. The confidence is really, really incredible. And we like to think that part of it is because it's something, again, is a skill that we enforce all the way up.
And the last example of celebration, this is something new we're doing this year at Hammershold, right? Again, started by, started by one of our uh, great teachers, is the National History Bee. Um, it's a obviously national uh, contest about knowledge of history. We had every student at Hammershold take the qualifying test. Everyone took it. We had 91 students qualify for the regional finals, and they're actually going to be held at Hammershold in April. I think it's April 17th. So that's just another way that we make history kind of like you know a big part of their day. And, and when the students found out, they were really, really excited about this. So we're, this is our first time through it. Historians listen to experts, right? Whether you're a student of history, a student in one of our classrooms, or whether you're a teacher, right, and you want to grow professionally, to develop professionally, you're listening to experts. It's a big key of what we do here in our social studies program. So for example here, we're trying to always bring folks in from the larger community who could help us with that. So on the uh, left-hand side is uh, the director of uh, the County of Freeholders, uh, Ronald Rios, and he came in to speak with our Churchill Junior High School students uh, last year about the importance of civic education. And what a freeholder does, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, sometimes students see, oh, we have a freeholder. Students tend to know what a mayor does, but what does a freeholder do, right? So he kind of informed them of what his job was and how they can kind of play a role in being part of that, that civic duties. It was a great presentation. The picture on the right was uh, Robert Zorn. Robert Zorn was one of the, uh, the writers of the books that we use about the Lindbergh kidnapping. And he came in and he met with our, uh, our students and it was great. He sat there for an hour and answered questions. What was interesting was the questions <coughs> that the students were asking was a blend of, tell us more about the Lindbergh kidnapping, you know, but a lot of it was, how did you do your research? How did you actually sit and write a book? They got wrapped up in the skills part of it as well as they were asking the questions. And I remember yeah. him commenting to us the first time he presented to our students, wow, those were great questions. Yeah, he was like, well, Usually I just get questions. asked about you know, the kidnapping, but they wanted to know about the skill of being a writer. That's a really, really, really important thing. And while you have that up there, let me yep. back, like you know, we've done this with a lot of writers too. This is Avi, famous, famous <coughs> author. Avi did a Skype session with our kids at Churchill. Um, Candace Millard who wrote this book, Destiny of the Republic, students were tweeting, sending her questions on Twitter that she was answering. So we want the kids to engage with the writers they read. And, and, we, and the writers always say that the students you know, show up really well. Yeah, the Candace Millard one's a funny story. Mm -hmm. uh, we read that in ninth grade. And the teacher, uh, Mike Smith, asked me one day, he says, you know, what do you, what do you think, Tom? I, I'd love to get Candace Millard. She's a huge name and it would cost us thousands of dollars to bring her in. So we couldn't bring her in live in person to speak with our students. But our students had read this book, loved the book. And she has, you know, her own Twitter account. And he said, what do you think? Should we, should we just start tweeting her questions? I said, yeah, why not? You have nothing to lose, right? So go for it. Start tweeting her questions. And after that, she started responding and was having kind of like a back and forth with the teacher. But the teacher was kind of presenting the, the student questions. And it was a really, really powerful, powerful thing. We've had Skype sessions with authors as well. So students being able to interact in that, in that uh, fashion, it's uh, really, really been great. OK. Yeah, yeah, OK. Have a good flight. One of the other things that we do in terms of bringing the community in <clears throat> is each year we do a Veterans Day celebration uh, at the high school. So in this case, we bring in uh, members uh, from all the branches, from the Marines, the Navy, Air Force, and Army. Uh, so we do a nice celebration there, but then we bring them into our classrooms so that they can interact with students, so they can talk about kind of their experiences. Many of them are veterans of our, of our current wars uh, in the Middle East. So they talk about that and what it's like to be you know, somebody who's relatively close in age to them, what it's like to be uh, in active, active service. So that's been a very, very powerful experience uh, for our students as well. And finally, this one uh, was, uh, was very recently. We had a uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day that we uh, honored at Churchill Junior High School. And we were very lucky we were able to get a survivor of the Holocaust to come in and speak with our students. Okay, so this is a generation of folks who are you know, rapidly you know, passing away. And so he's a 93-year-old gentleman, lives in Monroe, was a Holocaust survivor, and he came in and he spoke with our students, and it was so powerful. In the opening moment of his presentation to our students, where he kind of held up, he rolled up his sleeve, where a tattoo once had been, which had you know, signified what his number was in one of the concentration camps. And he talked to our students about how, for two or three years, I can't remember what it was, that that was who he was. He was a number. He, he, he wasn't a name, he wasn't an identity to the Nazis, he was just a number. And then he went in and he spoke about his life during the camps and then you know, transitioning after the war and how it shaped the rest of his life. It was such a powerful experience. So any time that we could bring the community into our schools, whether it's a politician, whether it's you know, uh, someone like this, it could be anybody, uh, that our students can become immersed in history. And that's one of the things that we really want the students to leave 
our program with, this, this feeling of immersion, to make them part of history, part of the experience, it's so, uh, so important to us. And that was a very, very impactful presentation uh, that he made. And another way you make history alive is you go places, right? So we bring people in, but then we send the kids out. So for the first thing, you know, if you, if you have children in the district, you know that everyone goes to the farm. We do different kinds of community. The kids get the apples. They all see, get to see the horse. That's very exciting, right? We bring kids to the municipal center, all right? And uh, when I talk to kids, how was it? Like, oh, we want to see the jail. They all want to see the jail. Um, but they get to go to the municipal center and see the court and see what that's like, even though it's right across from the library, as they all know. They get to go inside. They can see, like, how their community works. Communities is a big, big part of our elementary curriculum. Right? As they get older, they go on other trips too. Like on the left there is the stock exchange, the floor of the stock exchange. On the right is the 9-11 museum, right? So we want the kids to go out. We want the kids to have these experiences. Yeah, the one on the uh, floor of the stock exchange was a great trip. That was one our economics teacher at the high school uh, led the students into a competition which we won. And it was really cool because it was a regular academic level economics class and we defeated a bunch of AP level mm -hmm. students at different schools and we won this competition. So we got to send our students to the floor of the stock exchange. And they were blown away by the experience because it was so digital. You know, I think sometimes, you know, we study the history of the exchange. We think of ticker tape flying all around and papers everywhere. But they couldn't believe how digital it was. And it was a really, really great experience for them to see what it's like to be a stockbroker. And then uh, also, too, uh, Dr. Moran mentioned the 9-11 Museum. That's become really a staple of, of, of what we do at the high school. We do that trip uh, each year now. And it is so powerful to hear the students and some of the things that they have to say after they come back from that experience is, is really, really a great thing. It's a great experience uh, that we provide for, for our students. And then another way we do both a field trip out and bringing people in is we've started doing virtual field trips, right? And again, engineered by the teachers. They did the research on this. We thought this was a great idea. So we'll have a bunch of students gathered in the media center at the library. And here on the left is Ford's Theater. So we can't bring the students to Ford's Theater, right? We can bring Ford's Theater to the students, and this is all live. You have people from the National Park Service talking live to the students, answering their questions. And the one on the right is uh, Edison's Labs, right? So Thomas Edison's Lab, that's another National Historic Site, and students learn about Thomas Edison in ninth grade. They can post questions to the rangers there. It's really, really interesting, and really, really great. Yeah. And finally, the historians collaborate, right? So they take all these skills that they've been able to develop, and they work with other mm -hmm. people who are also working to uh, refine those same skills. So that's, a, again, a big piece of what we do in our social studies program. We share out. So for example, here are the picture on the top left-hand corner. That's from one of our criminal justice classes at the high school. And what our teacher does is he brings students outside and they kind of get to experience. We asked you that question before on the Fourth Amendment. They get to have a conversation with the police officers about the Fourth Amendment and how it applies during traffic stops and things of that sort. So again, learning from the community. It's a big piece. This is a great collaboration um, example on the top right-hand corner as it's students from our mock trial program, which is a very successful club here at East Brunswick High School, going to Hammershaws to talk students through a, uh, a moot court, a, a simulation uh, exercise. It was really, really great. It was a, it was a two hour long uh, activity that they ran with the Hammerschultz students and it was, uh, it was really, really powerful. And then finally, one of the, the great experiences that we have as part of our social studies department is our AP IPL team or the We the People uh, team. So this is a group of seniors uh, two years ago. Actually, this picture was taken in Washington, D.C. after we had won a state championship we got to represent uh, New Jersey at the national championship, and here we were at the, at the Sam Rayburn building uh, at Congress, and it was so uh, impactful as our students got to testify and talk about congressional issues, and they got to apply so much of the research and the knowledge that they had. Uh, one of the cool things for me as a history nerd was uh, we found out right before we walked <laughs> in the room that this was one of the rooms where they had the main Watergate hearings uh, back during the, the time of, of Richard Nixon's uh, ultimate resignation. So it was just a really, really powerful experience. And I'm happy to say that just a couple weeks ago, we won the state championship again. So uh, in late April, we'll be going back down to Washington representing uh, New Jersey in the national championship. And it's, it's a really, really great program. And what this program does is it gives back. Uh, it works with students uh, in the We the People Club in eighth grade, where we hold each spring a kind of a, a contest for them, where they come to the high school and they compete in an in afternoon long uh, presentation uh, in front of our seniors. It's, it's a really, really good uh, experience. 
So what we tried to show you is that, you know, what historians do is what we want students to do, that tho those two categories aren't exclusive, right? And this is something that the teachers talk to students about all the time. It's kind of in the air we breathe now in the history department, and we're really, really excited about that. Um, and that's, if you talk to your students, you'll see it. it's a skill-based curriculum, and they'll be the first ones to tell you. So thanks for coming, and we'll certainly be around. We invite you to look around at some of the books that are on the tables um, so you can see the kind of things that students read. And we'll be around to take questions if you want to talk to us. Yeah. Thanks for coming out tonight. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank thanks. You. Thank you.